what was one of the first moments in nature that you can remember? One of my first moments that I can remember is going camping with my dad. And I think we were in Springfield, Illinois or something like that. We had been, had gone to the Lincoln cabin or something. And um, we camped that night and my dad had this old tent. It was green and yellow and it had, it wasn't like the tents that we have now that just pop open and you can put them together by yourself. They were metal poles that you had to fit into each other and this plasticky waterproof material that always stunk. Um, and we were in that tent and it was raining. And what we did not know was that when my dad had packed up, I have no memory of any of the rest of the camping, but this moment when we woke up and our tent was filled with water, just soaking wet. Our whole, all of our sleeping bags, our clothes, everything was soaking wet. And a raccoon had chewed through the side of the tent to get to our bag of sandwich bread that my dad had sub shoved inside. And then it rained and all that rain came in through our tent. And you might be thinking as you listen to this story that that is not a positive memory, but it is a memory. It's a moment that has stuck with me through all of my years of life, all of my other natural experiences. And it just kind of taught me something about the power of nature and the power of um, getting wet and, and being uncomfortable. And I was probably six or something like that at the time. Now, that didn't shape my natural experiences and my and my life forever, but it is my first natural memory. And if you think back into your mind about what your first natural memory is, what is it? Is it sitting out at a park with your family? Is it playing outside in your backyard? Is it going for a walk? Is it seeing geese fly over your house for the first time? What is the first memory that you have in nature? And if you have a hard time thinking about something, if it's hard for you to kind of think of an, of an experience outside of a building or outside of your house, that's something that, that affects a lot of us, that affects a lot of kids in the country. It affects the, a lot of adults in the country because a lot of our lives are spent inside and controlled and, and in front of technology that we have a hard time as a, as, as a community thinking about natural experiences and then taking it a step further, thinking about natural experiences in a positive light. I'm going to talk a little bit about the effects of nature and outdoor experiences and environmental education today. I'm gonna to talk about how, how those affect us, how those affect our lives, and why it's important for everybody to have those kinds of experiences. So thank you so much for joining me today. I am Natalie Martin. I am a freelance outdoor educator. I'm a master gardener uh, with the University of Illinois Extension. I'm a mom. I am a person who loves nature. Um, and I have a background in fish and wildlife conservation. And kind of what that means is all of those things together have um, given me a passion and a drive to expand the opportunities that are available to everybody to gain outdoor experiences, to gain environmental education, to gain access to nature. Um, I have uh, been in this industry for about 15 years. Um, going back to uh, my undergrad education, I uh, studied fish and wildlife conservation um, and then really had an eye opening experience when I got to work with an off campus internship teaching fourth graders about aquatic invasive species, which is very specific, super niche, right? Like very, very, um, not something that everybody knows about, not something that everybody cares about, but that was one of the cool things about it was I got to have one-on-one -on -one time with students teaching them not only what these things were, what aquatic invasive species are, but why they should care about them. And I got to see them form those connections to these things, form those, uh, the ability to care about these things. Um, and over my semester, really got to 
establish a relationship with these students and the natural world. You might be wondering why this is an important topic to you. Um, I know that as a, as a young person, um, or if you're watching this and you're not a young person or just a person in the world, you know that climate change and our environment are a big focus of a lot of topics, a lot of, on the news, a lot of topics in just daily conversation. I don't want this to be a doom and gloom program. I don't want this to be about how we need to start things right now. You know, we need to change things right now in order to save our environment. That's not what today is about. Today is about thinking about your experiences and thinking about the experiences of, of those around you and how they formulate the way we think about things and the way we see the world. When I I'll tell you a little bit about what formulated my, cemented my relationship with nature and what kind of set my life along the path that it has gotten to now. I grew up in the western suburbs of Chicago, and I um, attended a school that thankfully had a budget for outdoor education and environmental education. And that what that, what the school board chose to do with that was to send students to um, a facility, in this case, Laredo Taft Campus, which is um, located in Oregon, Illinois. Um, and Taft Campus was a artist community that was started by Taft, the artist, Laredo Taft, the artist. And it had started as a place where artists got together and um, made art and communed and spent time. And uh, the University of uh, Northern Illinois University purchased it and turned it into a place where their um, outdoor education grad students would go and, and practice and, and, and learn. And it, it developed into a facility where students from all over the state of Illinois would come and spend two to three days and, and have outdoor experiences and get dirty and get cold and get wet and learn about the natural world in Illinois. And I was set to go in fifth grade. It was a big rite of passage for those of us that were in fifth grade. You go and you bring plastic bags to shove in your boots so that when your boots get wet, your feet don't get wet. And it's just like this visceral memory of having these sloshy plastic boots swishing next to each other as you're walking to and from the dining hall and to and from class. Um, we played a game called Alpha Wolf with Alpha Wolf, which is a, a nighttime game. So we got to go out with our classmates at night and have play this kind of adventure game, hide and seek game. And we left there feeling like the coolest kids that had ever existed. And then they changed the policy so that sixth graders would go instead of fifth grade. And my year, we got to go twice in a row. So I got to go to Laredo Taft as a fifth grader and then as a sixth grader. And I remember that feeling of like being the coolest kid in the world after I left Laredo Taft as a fifth grader, doubling that as a sixth grader who got to be the only, you know, one of the only classes that got to go twice. And every experience I remember watching birds. I remember eating in the dining hall. I remember sleeping in bunk beds with my classmates. And it stuck with me for years. It's something I would think back on, something classmates, even to this day, high school classmates and I have talked about it. Um, like, remember, we got to play this stuff. And then as I was getting older, those, those memories fade, right? They have, you have a fondness for them, but they don't, they're not at the forefront of your mind. They're a kind, nice, fun memory, but they don't feel visceral. You can't feel that plastic swishing in your boots. You can't taste the cinnamon rolls in the dining hall. You can't do those things anymore, but you, everything ha you can remember them, but they have softer edges. And I went to Kyle High School and college and I, and I decided to go into fish and wildlife conservation because I knew, you know, I had started out along a path of, of uh, pre-veterinarian and animal sciences. And as a, as a student that is not, a, not your classic learner, those subjects and, and that competitive um, atmosphere was not a good fit for me. But I knew I still wanted to do something specifically with animals. That was the thing that always stuck with me was animals. I wanted to focus on helping animals and caring for animals. Um, and I found out that I could do a conservation program. 
I could do that kind of thing. And that fit really well with what my, my heart wanted to do. And then I graduated and I had to find a job. <laughs> and who was hiring but Laredo Taft Campus? Laredo Taft, that site of some of my fondest environmental memories, some, some nature memories that stuck with me for a very long time. I got to apply and I accepted a position to lead all of those programs that meant so much to me as a kid. And that full circle aspect of being able to lead these programs that were foundational for me really cemented a lot of the things that I wanted to do. And then life happens. You can't keep a job all the time that is, is based only on joy. <laughs> there are other things that we need to worry about, like bills and relationships and families and things like that. But making sure to stay connected to nature and pass on that joy of nature to other people has stuck with me. And I've been able to continue to do those things for my whole life. And how lucky for me that I was able to do that as a kid, to have that experience that meant such a big deal to me. How great that I had the privilege to do that. I grew up in a predominantly white, affluent, suburban area. We had green spaces that I could access on a regular basis. So it was easy for me to form that relationship with nature. I didn't have to travel potentially through an unsafe area to access nature. I could walk almost to my backyard and gain access to it. And that's not something that is available to everybody, but it's also even in those suburban white affluent areas, it's not something that's seen as necessary it's not something that's seen as important all the time. It was it was shown to me by my family and by the people that I care for that being outside and being part of nature is important and was important. And I was sometimes forcefully <laughs> made to have those experiences, even if I wasn't feeling like I wanted them at the time. But that's not something that's available to everybody. And that's something I'd like to dive into a little bit next. Okay, so what is environmental justice? Environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, uh, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So that definition came directly from the EPA website. And the EPA does have an active environmental justice department um, you know, a lot of times because it's part of our government and part of, you know, part of the group that makes the regulations and enforces the regulations, maybe things don't always happen at a, at a high speed. And that could be something that, that we have heard complaints about, you know, about environmental justice is that when there are problems and there are complaints, they're not having, they're not rectified in a fast manner. And that's because there's always money involved, right? But if we wanted to take, leaving that out, if we wanted to take that definition a little farther and we wanted to talk about what fair treatment means. Fair treatment um, within that definition of environmental justice is, the, is that no group of people should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, governmental, and commercial operations. So if you live in a home and outside of your home, the environment is hostile. The air quality makes it so you can't breathe. You can't play in the water outside of your house because it could have toxins in it. If the environment outside of your house is a threat, it's going to be very, very hard for you to formulate positive environmental experiences. It is a hurdle that is sometimes impossible to climb. So you have we have to our you know our job as environmental educators is to figure out ways that we can communicate the importance 
of the environment and how informing environmental experiences, the importance of those things, importance of those things to people in a way that everybody can understand and that everybody can associate with. But if your environment outside of your window is actively causing you harm, you have no motivation to create a positive environmental experience. Okay, so if we're, you know, if we're taking it, you know, if we're going with that definition of environmental justice, that means that we're acknowledging that certain parts of our population in America or other where, anywhere, um, certain parts of our population are receiving a disproportionate amount of negative environmental effects. So if we're talking about making sure that everyone has access to positive environmental experiences, a book or a resource that I would love to call your attention to is Black Faces, White Spaces by Carolyn Finney. Sure. Carolyn Finney um, is an academic that works in the natural resources and environmental sciences departments. I believe she's at the University of Kentucky. Um, and she does a lot of work around how natural spaces are perceived and how making sure that everybody has access to those spaces. And here's a quote from the preface of her book. In the case of race and the environment, it's not just who we imagine has something valuable to say. These assumptions, beliefs, and perceptions can be found in the very foundation of our environmental thinking, how we define the environment, and how we think of ourselves in relationship with the environment. Who do we see and what do we see? So if you're somebody that has a hard time even going outside because of the environment outside, I could imagine that it would be very hard for you to see yourself at a national park, at a state park, or accessing those spaces. So we want our job as environmental educators is to improve that access, improve the knowledge that the, these spaces are available to everybody, improve the threshold so that instead of that big hump that it is to get over to have those environmental experiences, we want to sand that down. So you don't have quite the hump. Maybe it's a speed bump and maybe eventually it'll be a ramp. And we can make those spaces accessible to everybody, make everybody feel that they have the privilege and the ability to go to those spaces and then make it feel like it's not a privilege, it's a right. These spaces are our national parks. These are our state parks. Everybody should have access and everybody should feel safe accessing them. And that's a very rose-colored way of looking at it. Yes, we all should. Yes, we all technically do. But not everybody wants to go. Not everybody feels they can go. Not everyone feels safe going. And you're like, I don't want you to feel like you have to go if you don't want to go. That's totally fine. Maybe something out in your neighborhood is more accessible to you. Maybe that's more down, up your alley. That's great too. But I want everybody to have the ability to access these spaces if they want to go to them. To talk a little bit more about um, black faces, white spaces, um, Carolyn Finney will focuses in that book on the underrepresentation specifically of African Americans, um, but in when it comes to the interest in nature, um, outdoor recreation, environmentalism, these are ha these have historically been they have been white, white dominated um, areas of interest, um, and that's and she takes that in, environmental justice movement and kind of takes it a step further, um, and and kind of. D digs down in into how it has been how how we define the environment how it is broken down into different areas and how it's been represented, represented over the years she takes what 
she she breaks down the history of these spaces and environmental history um, and breaks down how years and years and years of racial violence, Jim Crow laws, geography, uh, you know, changing of geography, how those things have shaped what the great outdoors means to everybody. So I really, really would encourage you if this is something that you're interested in at all, to take a look at this book, to check out this book and, and kind of really think about um, what your historic access has been to environmental spaces and how you see environmental spaces and how you would like to see them going forward. What was your last moment of awe? What was the last time that you looked at something and it made you stop and really think about it? What was the last thing that, that you experienced that made you want to learn more about that subject? It doesn't have to be natural. It can be anything. It can be a piece of history that you, you read about or saw a documentary and it stopped you in your tracks. And it made you want to find out everything about that topic. Awe is one of those hard to pin down emotions that really has really shapes a lot of, of what we care about, a lot of what we want to talk to our friends about, a lot of what we spend our time thinking about. And encouraging awe and finding out more about things is something that I'm very passionate about as an, as an educator, as a mom, as a person. I want to hear the thing that's, that's in your brain that, that you can't stop thinking about. Tell me everything about it. So me as a person, awe is a foundational part of who I am encouraging awe in my kids, in my students, in other people, talking about something that I saw and couldn't stop thinking about. Sharing that joy and that awe with others is something that brings me a lot of joy. I read this article, it was a couple months ago, I think, in the Washington Post. Um, and the title of the article was, Awe Might Be Our Most Undervalued Emotion, and Here's How to Help Children Find It. And the story kind of in the, at the beginning, it, the um, author of this article talks about how she, her dad, when she was growing up, would drag her out of bed in the middle of the night to go look at the stars. And she just would grumble and hate it, but it's some of her best memories. Um, and she still thinks about those memories to this day. And that's similar to me with my wet tent my soggy sleeping bag, my rustling plastic in my boots at Laredo Taft. These are experiences that stopped me in my tracks and really made me think about other things, really made me come alive. And encouraging awe in children is great, but encouraging awe in adults is great too. And like I said, it doesn't have to be outside. It's great to do them outside. It's great to stand at the bottom of a waterfall in a canyon, feel the spray, look up, not necessarily be able to see the top, not know where that water is coming from, but know that it is coming and it is coming down. It has shaped everything around you and will continue to shape everything around you after you leave. Awe can be from watching the fantastic fungi documentary on Netflix, which I highly recommend. Awe can be from reading an article about a volcano or a tsunami, because awe can be disastrous. The tsunami in Tonga had the ability to change not only people's lives, but geography, which is horrible and magnificent at the same time. And we have the space as human beings to acknowledge both of those things. So think about what was the last thing that brought you awe. Think about the thing that 
the last thing that you had in your life you came across that you couldn't stop thinking about, you needed to research, you needed to look up, you needed to think more about. Maybe you watched the Fantastic Fungi documentary and then two days later you watched it again because it was so cool that you had to go back and watch it over again. Find that awe and you can find some of the things that you're most passionate about. It doesn't have to be your career. You don't have to, to make your career based on your awe. You don't have to make your career based on the thing that you're most passionate about. It's okay to do more than one thing. But find something that brings you joy and brings you awe and fully embrace that thing. The third resource that I wanted to talk about was a book by Richard Louv called Last Child in the Woods. And this book is, it basically talks about how children now and humans now experience nature. And it talks about the divide between young people and the natural world and how that divide affect us environmentally, socially, psychologically, and spiritually. It, it talks about uh, research, the necessity of contact with nature for healthy development, both in children and adults. Breathing fresh air, getting sunlight. If any of you have, a, have had seasonal affective disorder, sad from being inside too much in the winter, um, that's a great example. Vitamin uh, D deficiency is a real deal. It affects us all. And, and just getting out in the sunlight on a regular basis can really, really help. But our society went through this period of time, and I think it's still in that time, where it's teaching young people to avoid direct contact in nature. It's that certain parts of nature can be dangerous, that, you know, I, as much as I love Discovery Channel, Shark Week is a great example of it. Sharks don't want to attack humans. That's not what they're trying to do. They're just trying to live their lives. But we have turned sharks into a vehicle of terror. Yeah, we should, we should have a healthy respect for wild creatures like sharks. But do we need to be afraid of them? I don't necessarily think so. Bees are another great example. If anyone watched the movie My Girl in the mid-90s, eek, that did a lot for the bee populations, I think. But being afraid of bees and adults being afraid of bees and encouraging their, their children to be afraid of bees then effects, it has farther reaching effects by anytime we see a bee, we kill a bee. We don't want to encourage bees in our yard, so we're not going to plant flowers that bees, that bees go to. We don't want to have, you know, bugs. So we, we spray for bugs to keep all of those annoying bugs and bees away from us in our, in our personal spaces. But then who's pollinating our plants? Who's making sure our crops can grow? Obviously, bees aren't the only pollinators out there, but they're pretty high profile. And when we eliminate environment, we eliminate and exclude lots of other pollinators as well. So when we encourage a fear or a distaste for certain environmental aspects, it has farther reaching consequences for other parts of the environment. There's ripple effects. So having, you know, media, schools, discouraging environmental experiences and discouraging a love and appreciation um, and enjoyment of outdoor spaces creates an entire generation of people that are disconnected from their environment and potentially damaging that environment in consequence. So, it's very important to have 
environmental education, outdoor education, outdoor experiences as part of our childhoods, as part of our school systems, as part of our adulthoods, so that we can develop that awe, that access, that enjoyment of environmental spaces from the start so that we can have lasting relationships, enjoyment, and appreciation of environmental experiences in the future. Again, I don't want this to be a doom and gloom, everything is awful. I want you to leave today and leave this experience thinking about when's the last time I enjoyed myself outside? What's the last thing I really love seeing outside? Maybe I should do that again. Maybe I can call you guys to action and say, I think you should try to have an outdoor experience this week or this weekend or tomorrow. It doesn't have to be big. It can be sitting outside and having your lunch outside. It's cold. You can do it. Don't worry about it. Just bundle up. Maybe it's walking instead of driving. The next time you have to go to a class, the next time you have to um, drop a book off at the library, choosing a natural experience could be that next awe experience for you. I don't want to be awful, but full of awe. Look up. Next time you hear birds flying over, look up and see if you can figure out what kind. Figure out if they're going north or south. If you don't know what kind they are, look it up. Think about the things that are happening around you. Think about them deeper. Think about them at not just a surface level. Try and think about them for 10 minutes. What kind of tree is outside my window? I wonder if it's going to have acorns. I wonder if it's going to have green leaves or purple leaves, or I wonder if it's going to turn red in the fall. There are different kinds of things that we can think about that will deepen our relationship with nature and hopefully with ourselves. Thank you so much for spending this time with me today. It really is an honor that I got to speak with you and share my experiences with you. Thank you again to Benedictine University for sponsoring this and, and including me in your program. I hope that everybody has a good rest of your day, rest of your week, and rest of your year.